Hey there, movie friends. Welcome to another installment of What's Your Favorite Movie? Everyone's Favorite Movie Podcast. If only this were a video uh, podcast so you could see my guest inventing the What's Your Favorite Movie shuffle as he dances in his seat to our theme song. Folks, uh, my name is Ed South. You can follow me on Twitter at Ed South. And my guest today is my good buddy, John. John, how are you? I'm good, thank you very much. John, thanks for coming all the way up here to the What's Your Favorite Movie Studios and joining us for a delightful discussion of all things cinema. You're welcome. Uh, and just some uh, housekeeping at the top of the show, as they always like to say on podcasts. You can follow me on Twitter, at Ed South. Follow the show at WYF Movie Podcast. We have a lot of fun over there on the old Twitter, doing all kinds of movie stuff and you should add us to your feed and please for the love of all that's good and holy would somebody please email the account <laughs> fave movie podcast at yahoo.com because no one has emailed us yet at that address it's kind of cool that i'm having john here on it's very cool that i'm having john on the show but it's a little serendipitous i think it might be the right word because john and i uh in Ernest attempted to get a podcast off the ground 10 years ago when podcasts were brand new and just started out and of course, like somebody's like, "Hey, you can do a radio show in your house." I'm like, "What? I need to do that." And John was the most uh, computer literate person I knew at the time, and we tried, and we failed. <laughs> we just could not get a show off the ground at that point in time. Absolutely, but well, here, it was a good effort. It was a good effort, but here we are. Um, we were still like in, on dial-up days back then. And, <laughs> um, I remember. Somebody you knew had a podcast, and we were like, oh, well, let's listen to it. And we like hit download and waited like 35 minutes, and we heard like maybe two minutes of it, and then it had to buffer and reload again. So, But here we are, and John and I are um, old co-workers. Uh, we worked many, many years ago uh, as crayon salesmen, I think is a color- <laughs> colorful, no pun intended, way to put it. Um, we worked for a major crayon distributor, creator, and uh, we've kept in touch all these years. So haven't seen each other in a while, but... Let's talk about movies. Absolutely. (laughs) And folks, before we get started today, let me tell you about our sponsor. Ooh, thank you very much. Um, We have lined up a a, a nice little deal for you. Now, if you're listening to the show, obviously you love movies. And one of the ways people communicate that they love movies is by their clothing. And that people love wearing their movie t-shirts. Now, anybody can go to the big box store and pick up a Ghostbusters shirt with a the Ghostbusters logo on it. But if you're really into Ghostbusters, how about a shirt that says, back off, man, I'm a scientist, with a little artistic rendering of the movie. And that's where DexShirts.com comes in. They have iconic cult and pop culture t-shirts, all kinds of movies, not only movies that we've mentioned here on the show, like Indiana Jones and Aliens and Back to the Future, but how about Total Recall, Predator, Evil Dead? You don't find those shirts in stores. Dex got, DexShirts.com has you covered. High-quality, premium, pre shunk t-shirts. Hop on over to their website and check it out. All kinds of cool stuff. And if you mention, or not mention because it's a website, but if you type in the promo code WYFMOVIE into the coupon area, you will get 20% off your order. So pick up some awesome tees. They are really cool conversation starters. These are things you're not going to see in the store um, I really like they have like a flux capacitator shirt with just that looks like you're running off the flux capacitator. Capacitator? Capacitator? Capacitor. Capacitor. I'm way off. <laughs> you're welcome. Deckshirts.com. Uh, that's D E X shirts. Use promo code WYF movie. 20% off your order. Unique and exclusive t shirts inspired by nostalgia, pop culture, and iconic movie themes. So you can probably tell um, by just listening that John is uh, from England. Yes. Yes. (laughs) Tell us about going to the movies in England. Tell us about growing up in movies uh, when you were growing up. You didn't come over here until after high school. Right. Right. So your uh, formative years were in the cinema, as they call it over there. And is movie going any different in England than here in the States? So I think probably the difference would be less to do with where it was and more to do with when it was. Okay. Like, yeah. um, I mean, I remember they built the multiplex at the top of the town where I live Okay. when I was in high school. So Yeah. I um, mean, my first time was like eighth grade that I went to a multiplex. Yes. So I remember... Do you remember the first movie you saw at the multiplex? (laughs) 
Not at the multiplex. The first movie I saw was yeah. Superman ever was Superman Two. Excellent, excellent. Um, and I remember seeing probably the I think it was the first Batman movie. Nice at the theater, the one screen theater that the multiplex killed. Right, right. Um, and what was significant about that is that in England they came up with a. When for that movie specifically for that movie that was the first movie that was rated twelve. Ah, and so how big did we feel and grown up did we feel going on our own to the one yeah. screen theatre to see to a twelve see a twelve rated movie? So go down the uh, British movie ratings. What's it? Do you know what it's called? Like it's here. It's the MPAA. What do they do? They know what that's called? I don't remember. My my mind is only wired for movies, so. It's, I will ask a question like, well, what's the rating system? I don't know what the rating... But anyway, do you know what, what a, it's like? 18, 15, 12, PG, and G? <laughs> As in they might not have a G, or you just don't know what it's called? I don't, don't like, remember Is it at, called. like, general? Yeah. Right? That's what yeah. G is. Okay. So that's interesting, because here we had the... Well, you have it broken down different, 18, 15, 12... We right. had PG PG thirteen didn't come out until eighty four, um, because of the double shot of Temple of Doom and Gremlins were both PG and everybody thought they should be more than PG, okay. but not quite are. So right. there's a little history lesson for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> so, but um, and then my other thing was like, Ameri- obviously, I mean, living in England, you're talking about Batman and Superman, which apparently you liked superheroes a lot, <laughs> but. How much um how much British film is mixed into the I mean American film is kind of predominant all over the globe pretty much but there's a, there's a decent amount of films made in England and England themed films and yeah yeah for sure so um I mean James Bond would be the obvious one right the obvious kind of long running but aren't those American films or are they I suppose right but I mean, we just flew the cameras over there <laughs> <laughs> so yeah I mean. The, the, and there are, there's a lot of stories, I don't know how many for kids necessarily, you know, that would have been things I would have seen when I was younger, but, and it definitely is one of those things where American culture reaches, right? you know, I mean, we watched on a Saturday afternoon on television, uh, Dukes of Hazard, nice. and De- Dempsey and Make Peace and Knight Rider and those shows, and in the movies the same, you know, a lot of those, right. the, you know, the superhero movies and the Star Wars and the same kinds of things. Right. So, I mean, there are there are things I guess that are uniquely British, but right. I don't. A lot of people in this country, literally, their first exposure to British television and film was Monty Python, which is an odd entryway into any culture I sure. would think because yeah. that's very extreme. Right, and the, and to encounter something by encountering a, parod- a parody of it. Right, right. Is a you, you know, I mean to get a parody you almost have to understand the, exactly. you know, the source material. Um so. I discovered Monty Python when I was younger and it wasn't a thing and and you know that every now everybody knows what Monty Python is, but I discovered it younger when I was a thing and I was obsessed with it and then I would seek out these other movies, I'd be in the video store and be like, oh, here's a movie with John Cleese and Terry Gilliam in it. Right. And then I'd get it home and watch it and, A, not even be able to understand what they were saying because it wasn't made for American audiences, so they're just going real fast and it's like, what? And then, like, not not as zany as a Monty Python movie, so I'm like, what is this? I don't care. But uh, I do remember the movie Clockwork was pretty good. Yeah. With John Cleese, that's good stuff. Yeah, yeah. And um, <laughs> I do remember when we worked together... I would come in all the time and ask you to translate things from one of my very, very <laughs> favorite movies. Do you remember? Yes, The Spice Girl. The Spice World. Yes. <laughs> I'd be like, what's this mean? What's that mean? Do they really do this in England? Do they really do that? And you'd be like, yes, yes, <laughs> yes. But then one day I asked you what bacon buddies were. Bacon buddies or butties? Yeah, butties. B-U-T-T. Yeah. Bacon butties, which they mention in Spice World, like... Folks, first of all, I'm not joking. I love that movie. It is so wonderful. I'm leaving now. I was going to say, I'll let me, let me wait for everybody <laughs> to turn off their podcast. Let, me out, let me out of this basement. <laughs> Studio. Um, yeah, and then I would come in and be like, John, what's Bacon Buddies mean? Which, if I recall correctly, is a bacon and mayonnaise sandwich on very thick bread. Yes. Excellent. Never had one? With ketchup. Maybe. With ketchup. Okay. Excellent. All right. 
So, um, as w- with every show, I've asked John to come up with a list of his five favorite movies, which he had a little difficulty. Did you have difficulty narrowing it down to five? Yes. Or coming up with five? Narrowing no, it I down think, to five. I think we've got some for a second visit, if that <laughs> proves to be something we <laughs> want to do. If the ratings allow. Yes. And, um, and you said, oh, that would be easier with television. What are some of your all-time favorite TV shows, real quick, besides Star Trek? Uh, <laughs> Is Star Trek still at the top? I don't know. I like that. Uh, Firefly, Battlestar Galactica. Um, what else? Hey, do you know where you can get a Firefly t-shirt? I believe I do. <laughs> Dexshirts.com, sir. So John came up with a list of his five favorite movies. The running time of this list in a whole, if you were to sit down and watch the, all these movies back to back, would take you over 13 and a half hours. In contrast, if you were to do my list... Seven hours and fifty nine minutes, so you could almost watch my list twice within yours. But that's okay. And was, were... the, I designed that deliberately so that your homework would be punishment. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, number one on your list is the epic sprawling film Gettysburg from nineteen ninety three. Oddly enough, filmed a mere fifteen miles, maybe from the What's Your Favorite Movie Studios. So tell us about Gettysburg. What makes you love Gettysburg so much? The movie, not necessarily the town. <laughs> the um I'm fascinated with history and I like the idea of a fictionalized documentary I suppose um a docudrama yeah one of the things that I like about history is this idea that there are these moments where people make decisions and those decisions have ramifications and and consequences that show up years later affect the whole world right that's and, an awesome way of... I've never thought of history that way. That's awesome. And that's most obvious when you're looking at military history. Right. Because there's actually... A, a, somebody's given an instruction, and if they do it, X happens. And if they don't do it, Y happens. Or, or it goes the way they expect, or it doesn't. So... Um, and people talk about the actual historical battle of Gettysburg as the high watermark of the Confederacy. They talk about it as... Um, this moment when the the sort of the last moment when the union might have lost the war the idea that a that you can visit that place but b that you can kind of explore those decisions and see some of those moments is is a huge deal so um as much as it is it is a four hour movie it four is, hours and 31 minutes right. according to imdb two sides of a dvd i didn't even know you could turn a dvd <laughs> over they didn't know it right. Right, until that and, movie and, yeah in fact the first time i watched it and it just kind of stopped i thought my dvd was broken <laughs> and then i was like oh no i can turn it over um so I have to I, let me. I have to <laughs> on, the, on the note of of long movies like that. Way back, and my wife might shoot me for telling this story, but I was at work actually at the Crayon Place, and uh, she's like, she was at home. She watched uh, Pearl Harbor, and she was like, "Wow, they really like jumped into that movie, and it it's like really went gung ho like right away, and then it seemed really short, whatever, blah blah blah." And I was like, "Um, you watched side two first, and not side one at all." But anyway. <laughs> So, yeah, it was a two. It was a. Two, I have the uh, two VHS of Gettysburg oh, in okay. a huge box. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, it's just great, and from, it's from a novel, so it's the, the Killing Angels, correct? Kill, yeah, Killer Angels. Killer so, Angels. Um, Did you read the book? I have the book. I haven't read it all the way through. <laughs> well, that's good enough for me. <laughs> um, yeah, I've I've been close to the book. <laughs> Does that count? I sleep near it. Um, and so there's questions about, obviously there were a million things going on and, and the things that the book focuses on and that the movie focuses on are only some of the things that are there. Sure. But, um, and whether some of these pivotal events were actually as pivotal as they're portrayed is a question. But um, th- just the scale, the ambition of, of wanting to tell you know, yeah. tell that story, wanting to recreate it, the the there were actual, you know, there's reenactors mixed in with right. the actors. Sort of applaud the ambition of it, and I I enjoy the, the the epicness of it. And this is where I think it's much more effective than the prequel, but because it focuses on these individuals and their individual decisions, you can kind of see the weekend build, right? And you can see how what happens happens, and you can experience it visually. Um, I, you know, I really, I enjoy it. It is a commitment of time. <laughs> um, 
But well, it, it was filmed as a TV miniseries originally. I assume you knew that, or maybe you don't. Know I that. didn't. Oh, okay. So it was shot as a TV miniseries for uh, TNT okay. cable, which they would never in a million years do something that scholarly now. Right. <laughs> It'd be a six hour Rizzoli and Isles special. <laughs> but, um, and then, so when you do the math at four hours and 31 minutes, like they were planning it. Well, I don't know. I read that while they were editing it, they were like, this is way bigger than TV. Let's make this a movie. But I guess right. if you're, if it ended up at four and a half hours, they were probably shooting for like a three night, two hours for three nights. And you said you didn't see it in the theater, though. No. Do you remember where you first saw it? And did, were you like, holy crap, this is awesome? So, I've yeah, I've read a lot about it. And then um, I came across a, a secondhand copy, you know, and was able to pick up a secondhand copy of it. And I think I'd seen pieces of it before. Maybe I caught some, you know, half an hour on television right. and that kind of thing. Um, but, yeah, I, I picked up a second-hand copy and, and watched it just kind of at home on DVD. So. I um, This is funny that this is on your list because I have, like, a very distinct memory about this movie because I, I got to see it in the theater, and I'm pretty sure it's the only time ever, 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 that I went to the movies with my mother and my father. It was always either one or the other took me. Right. It took us or me. And that's the only time, and I was 20, 20, I was born in 73, so I was probably like 20, and we went to a big theater in D.C. and saw it like on this huge wow. wraparound screen. Um, it was blown up to a 70 millimeter print, so it was like six track surround sound and uh, just, you know, huge, like you literally had to turn your head to see the whole screen. And uh, just that alone was impressive and awesome and to see. And... I'm not a huge history buff. I also get lost in movies fairly easily, even though I'm a huge movie buff. But uh, it's a great movie. I mean, it's just, it's sure. really interesting. And you can break it up. You don't have to sit there and watch it. And some movies lose their oomph if you stop and start. But this is right. definitely one that was obviously filmed and made to be <clears throat> broken up into pieces. So you could do it in chunks. And it's accessible, I think, to people that don't. You, you can go into it not knowing anything about the right. Civil War. I guess right. you should have a little bit of a idea of what's going on with the Civil War. What are they fighting about? But, uh, <laughs> and then this is directed, uh, <clears throat> I love when whenever like these movies come on the show and I like look for all these weird fun facts or whatever. This is directed by a guy named Ron Maxwell, who also directed the prequel, Gods and Generals, which I didn't know was a prequel. I thought it was a sequel, but did you see that? Yeah. His two movies before <laughs> Gettysburg were The Parent Trap 2 <laughs> from 86, which is a great movie. Tom Skerritt's in it. And then he directed Kid Co. from 1984. I love Kid Co. Have you ever seen Kid Co.? I have heard of neither of those movies, <laughs> let alone seen them. Just real quick, Kid Co. <laughs> is about these kids that... Like, want to do, like, have a lemonade stand, or this kid, like, is, like, running a bingo racket in the locker room at school, and he's trying to make money, and then he comes across uh, collecting horse manure and reselling it, as or horse poop, and then reselling in this manure, and he builds this big business. Such a great movie. And I learned some cuss words from it when I was little, so that's also there I as will, well. I will look you will, for that. It's a, it would be a good double feature. <laughs> Gettysburg and Kid Co., and then maybe tap it off with the parent trap, too. Okay. There you go. Um, in Gettysburg, you got Tom Berenger, Martin Sheen, Jeff Daniels, Sam Elliott, all kinds of big heavyweight yeah. actors. Uh, and epic facial hair. <clears throat> epic facial hair, right. Actually, I lo- read that it won some stupid fake award for worst beards. So, Oh, really? Not that epic, John. They're not, they're <laughs> not the worst beards. They're the greatest. <laughs> Tom Berenger was so fond of his role as General James, do you know? Long Tom Berenger's Longstreet. Right. As uh, he, Tom Berenger was so fond of his role as uh, Longstreet, he later opened a restaurant slash nightclub in Wilmington, North Carolina, called Longstreet's Irish Pub, which is still in business today. Very cool. His favorite role was not the substitutes one through four. It was <laughs> that uh, there's a restaurant in Gettysburg with all the where like I think like the um, the staff and the, the the crew and the cast loved going. It's this, like, buffet where they serve, like, all-you-can-eat Salisbury steak. Nobody I ever take there likes it, but all the pictures are on the wall. I said to my wife, I should take John there after we record. She's like, no, don't take John there after you record because no one wants to eat all-you-can-eat Salisbury steaks. (laughs) So that's Gettysburg. Clear clear out a couple of nights on your schedule, and you should watch it, folks. It's good stuff. You might learn something. 
Uh, moving on the list, 1973's Oscar winner for Best Picture, The Sting. Now, you didn't see this in the theater in 1973. No, I did. You did? No. No, <laughs> no your mom took you. Yeah. Um, this was really good. Now I had not seen this before and, uh, wow. so I rewatched it the other night. I thought I had seen it when you, when you gave me your list, I was thinking of the hustler also okay. about gambling. Right. This isn't about gambling, but, but also Paul Newman, but this is uh Paul Newman and Robert Redford and give him a quick, uh, rundown on what happens here in the sting. So is there I'm, a quick rundown? Of what no, there is, there is. We'll figure it out. I'm, <laughs> I'm a sucker for caper movies. I love Ocean's Eleven type kind of... Oh, yeah, we all went to Ocean's Twelve for your birthday yeah, one year. Yeah. yeah. With the setup, you know, the the gang comes right. together, there's the setup, there's the... And particularly movies that, as they're doing that, they actually keep the audience guessing. Yeah. So um, in this, uh, in, in The Sting... Uh, Robert Redford runs the numbers, and he's a, a small-time criminal. Uh, his mentor is killed by uh, the bad guy, um, <laughs> and, and agents of the bad guy. Right. Um, and he is then referred to Paul Newman, to Henry Gondorf, uh, to get even. Um, and he's like a legendary yeah, small yeah. time crook legend and right. he knows all the tricks and he he's the um he he yeah he can set up all the big cons and he knows the strategies and he robert redford's character um hooker wants sort of he's the young punk and he wants quick revenge and gondorf says well you can do that or you can do it my way and we can really take the guy yeah. to the cleaners um, and so they set up this very elaborate, very uh, substantial, uh, <laughs> extended uh, con to um, to get even. And when you said it keeps the audience guessing, you don't even know you're being played also. Like, you don't even know what's... You don't know what's real and what's right. fake, but you don't right. know that you don't know what's real, what's fake. Right. You think it's all... Yeah. And then the end was like, what? Yeah. Which we're not going to give away the ending, because right. you should definitely... Yeah. This is this is one of those movies that's, like, solid. Like, really good, still completely accessible to audiences. Yeah. It's not... I mean, it's 40 years old, 42 years old, because it's the same year I am. <laughs> and um, it's it's... It's just as fresh as it came out today. I mean, I'm sure they could pick up the pace a little bit for today's audience, but anybody could watch this and totally get it. Right. And there are the, <clears throat> there are three big twists mm-hmm. that you don't see coming that work terrifically, yeah. effectively, that that really keep keep you as an audience member on on your toes. And this is one thing that, again, a, a thing that I really enjoy. I don't always like i mean sometimes you do but i don't always like just sitting there and being right broadcast at (laughs) you know i like to actually be surprised i like to work um for for the story a little bit and and there are at least three yeah big big twists in this movie and you don't see them coming and it's one of those where once you've seen it once i mean you want to see it again to see how they did it yeah but but you it also like you almost wish that you could experience it again yeah the the That's... and you know you wish you could see it again for the first time and not know what's coming because and i hope this isn't giving too much away it's not it's not like you didn't see it coming it's like you turn around and like what like i didn't even see that come and go by me like it's right. so yeah. the end cuz I my movie diet is the opposite. It's very here's what happens. Point A, point B, point C, point D. The seal gets a family. He goes home in the end and becomes the mayor. And that's the movies that I watch. Uh, yeah, this was like not all over the place, but it was just like what? What happened? What? You would want to watch it again and be like, okay, well, if that happened, then why would this happen? And you watch it and you see like all these little subtle things, like oh yeah, right. that's. Right. That's I'm mean, speaking too vaguely, but um, and then <clears throat> you got um, are you a big fan of Newman and Redford in general? Like yeah. they're just great actors, sure, and whatever, sure. And uh, Robert Redford was just in uh, uh, Captain America. Did you see that? Right. One? Yeah, yeah, he was awesome in that. And he had one out recently called A Walk in the Woods, where him and uh, 
Nick Nolte go hike the Appalachian Trail. That was really cool. Did you see it? I didn't see it. You were shaking your head like you saw it, but you didn't see it. But it was good. Um, And then he's in Pete's Dragon this summer, which is going to be questionable because (laughs) the original is better. But Robert Shaw is in this. Yeah, he's the The big heavy bad guy. Oh, my God. He was so good. Like, because I just watched, uh, rewatched Jaws last year. And he's, uh, you know who he is in Jaws? Or he's the, have you seen Jaws? No. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. Hey, where is the safe zone? Because I haven't seen. I have not seen Jaws. <laughs> Don't tell anybody. I won't. Um, in Jaws, he's like a, like a salty old sea captain. Like, I, I tell you what, matey. Not, okay. not, not quite that cartoonish, but complete world's different here. Like he And he is like heavy and like mean. and Right, and uh, really... Very little dialogue, and yeah. he has this catchphrase. He, he gives you an instruction, and then he says, "You follow." Right. And, and what he means is, you know, do it now, or I'm going to bury you. Yeah. You know? It's and, like tense when he's on screen. Like, yeah. you're like I don't want to be in the room with this dude. Yeah. yeah. And the, and the fact that you know these two guys that we like, these smiley, kind of clever, uh, slick con artists, hustlers. Uh, are trying to get over on the guy, and and he is he's dangerous enough that you actually you're concerned for them. You yeah, know? And, um, yeah, it's amazing when Redford and Newman get the group together, and then they bring in uh, Ray Walston. You know him? Yeah. Are you with me on that? Okay. Yeah. Um, from uh, well, everybody, he's like my favorite Martian was his big role, but he's Mister Hand in uh, Fast Times at Ridgemont High, and uh, he's also uh, what was the other? Oh. He's Popeye's father in Popeye, and I love Popeye. But and then uh, Harold Gould's the other guy, the the uh, the other guy they bring in who pretends to be like a doctor or something or Kid Twist. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Um, he's a great actor too. So yeah. like, they're like two of my favorite character actors. So as soon as they like brought them in, I was like, whoa, this is awesome. And and again, this movie is like part of what I love about a lot of these stories is the kind of getting the gang together. Yeah, and this movie really. In the same way as you know, Ocean's Eleven, both the original Ocean's Eleven and the the remake does, it spends time kind of bringing everybody right. together. And this notion that you know they know people in all these other cities right. and they can call them in and the, yeah. and they p- people owe them favors so they can sort of you know, hey, we got a big fish, we need right. some help, you know, and, and all these people come in <clears throat> and there's a very specific uh, physical. Uh, signal that they they give each other kind of to indicate that they've sort of seen each other and yeah. recognized what's going on it's it's very well done and even though they're all criminals it's like they're well they're definitely like a family and it's like you want to be in on it like you want to hang out with them because right. they're all like so cool it's like it's like oh yeah we're gonna bust this dude because he killed a guy it's like hey we don't care why we're just in because it's awesome and we're gonna do this big <laughs> right this big uh this big the sting it's called and, the sting and as you said you know 40 years old but it stands up yeah you know the performances the script the twists the 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 layout it takes place in 1936 i think so it's not dated because it's supposed to look old i mean you know it's it's not it doesn't drip of 70s like some 70s movies does um oh yeah there it is september 36 it takes place um shoot what was i gonna say oh did you see um ant-man Yes. Recently, did you like that? Because that's the same kind of like caper, like let's get the team together yeah. kind of set yeah. up. Um, they kind of strayed from the Marvel path and did the caper thing, and that sure. was really good. Um, and then the Sting, so I said it was nominated for Best Picture. It beat The Exorcist and American Graffiti, which are classics. And then I, it's interesting when you go back and look at like what was nominated and the, whatever this year, 74 was the Oscars. So you have The Sting, The Exorcist, American Graffiti, classics. Although I would say The Exorcist and American Graffiti are talked about a lot more than The Sting kind of is starting to fall in the back. But then the other two movies that year, I don't, I don't even know what I didn't write it down. I don't know what they are. And they're like it's interesting what, what movies, you know, stay with us and which movies fall into the background. But it was nominated for uh, best, it won best screenplay, and then it won the best score, um, which I noted when I was watching it. Like the just most of the score is just piano mm-hmm. music, which yeah. is really awesome. It's all rag, rags rag time, yeah. by uh, Scott Joplin, and then they brought Marvin Hamlish in to kind of adapt it into a score. But it's got all the the entertainer just starts off like so powerful with the entertainer playing that ding 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 ding, and it's got old paintings and everything. And 
It's really cool. And then it was nominated, or he won Best Director, George, George Roy Hill, who also did Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, which had Newman and Redford as well. Have you seen that? Oh, yes. I many, have not. Many times. <laughs> Is that, I would like to see it. Slaughterhouse Five. Are you familiar with that? Me no. neither. But he directed that, and I recognize the name. And they did Slapshot with Paul Newman, which is the hockey movie that's really popular. His last film was uh, Funny Farm with Chevy Chase, which, when I thought about it, is kind of the same deal. Did you ever see Funny Farm? No. He, Chevy Chase and his wife want to sell their house because they're getting divorced, and they like pay the whole town to put on a ruse that they are a perfectly functioning, happy... It's like a big sting, again. I thought that was kind of a cool, <laughs> cool uh, parallel. So you should definitely check out The Sting, 1973. John says so. I say so, too. I bought the Blu-ray of it. I don't even buy Blu-rays, but that's know. all I could find. So I did it. I hate like doing this show now. It's like you can't just go to the video store and get these movies. You have to hunt them down. It becomes a hunt. And I spent a whole day, like a month ago, looking for Troop Beverly Hills. <laughs> I was easier. It was easier to find The Sting. <laughs> but um, that was that. John, yes, would sir. you like to play a little game real quick? Yes. <laughs> Let's. <laughs> um, well, as I mentioned, we were we used to work together at uh, for a crayon company, and at one point uh, they asked me to put together a game show for an event we were doing. Do you remember that big day where we had like all these things going on? Right. Yeah. So they were like, "Can you do this game show?" So wait, you got to put together a game show, <laughs> and I had to wear a crayon costume. Is that what it was? <laughs> <laughs> were you in the costume? Oh yes. I wanted to wear the costume so bad, well, but it wouldn't fit. <laughs> and we had that cat thing, Miffy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we could say her name, whatever. She's long gone. That the cat. I want. I want to be. I want to be a costume character so bad. Couldn't do it. But yes, yes, I got to do. Well, I did the game show. They said we want like forty-five minutes, and then the day of corporate was like, no, no, ten minutes. So I had to like cut half of it. Does that sound like something that would have happened at that job, John? <laughs> so one of the things I did was came up with this game. Crayon or movie. Oh. It was different colors of crayons mixed in with movie titles. And then you were supposed to guess crayon or movie. And I found this. I remember I still had it in my computer. So I printed it out. <laughs> so would you like to take a quick gander and see if you remember which are crayons and which are... Weren't we supposed to like know all 100 plus colors of the crayons or whatever that was like supposed to be ideally a Maybe. thing? Maybe. But, all right. Real quick. Okay. Color or movie. Tickle me pink. Uh... Crayon. Pretty in Pink. Movie. Banana Mania. Uh, crayon. Wild Strawberry. Wild, wild Strawberry. Wild Strawberry, yes. Crayon. Yes. <laughs> it's good. I did good writing here. Tim, <laughs> Timberwolf. Uh, movie. That's a crayon. Okay. Was a crayon. Soylent Green. Is a movie. <laughs> Bittersweet. Uh, crayon. Outer Space. Crayon. Blue Lagoon. Movie. Oh, that's right. It's a movie. Burnt Sienna. Crayon. Everyone's favorite crayon. White Fang. Movie. Men in Black. A uh, movie. Pink Panther. Movie. Carnation Pink. Uh, crayon. That's it. Yes. I think they were supposed to be dealt out among people, but not in one continuous. But there you go, folks. Crayon or movie. A 14-year-old bit. That I dug out for this podcast. You're all very, very welcome. I'm on it. <laughs> yeah, like at the last minute they were like, oh no, you can't do all this. Ten minutes tops. And I had like all this stuff planned that I worked on for a week and whatever. And I had like one of the girls that we worked with wear like a cocktail dress and she was supposed to be like my little Vanna White. And they were like, no, no, no. She's got to put her uniform back. Anyway, <laughs> let's move on. Another movie on your list, The Guns of Navarone. Now when you showed me this, I was like, ooh, a John Wayne film. I'm down for that. I haven't seen it's not a John... <laughs> you just gave me a look. <laughs> what? It's not a John Wayne film, folks. It is not a Western, as I thought. And then I read what it was, and I was like, a oh, World War II? I just... Civil War? Now i got to go to World War II? But Guns of Navarone was the jam. That was good. Yeah. Tell us about Guns of Navarone and where you came to... Wait. We didn't... Where did you first see the sting? Where did I first see <laughs> the sting? They just bounce all over the place. TV. Uh, uh, a long time ago, but my, my dad likes a lot of movies, and I saw Sting and Guns of Navarone probably at his recommendation. Oh, that's cool! You know, yeah. So, can we have him on the show sometime? Probably. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> All right. So, Guns of Navarone, 1961. What happens? It's a World War Two movie. 
the Nazis install two large artillery pieces uh, looking over the Mediterranean, and a narrow part of the Mediterranean by Crete, I believe. Mm-hmm. And um, there are four British destroyers that need to get past to evacuate an island to to relieve some troops and, and evacuate. Well, there's like an island with like 2,000 people right. or something, they said. Right. right. So they got to get these four destroyers past this narrow spot in the Mediterranean with, that's overlooked by these two guns, and um, they have to destroy the guns. So first they consider invading the island with a large number of troops, and they realize they're not going to be able to do that. So then they assemble a small... Uh, commando team led by Gregory Peck to um, to destroy the guns and again same kind of deal adventure story small team yeah bunch of reverses bunch of uh, twists and turns and things that you think are going to go one way that go another right. way um, some great action and escapes a nice car chase <laughs> uh, and um, is this based on a true story? No, it's well, I, inspired. Inspired, yeah. I don't think it's as, as direct as Gettysburg. Maybe right. it, it's a it's an Alistair MacLean novel. The okay. same the same guy who wrote Firefox, um, which was a Clint Eastwood movie. Clint Eastwood okay. stealing a super deluxe uh, secret right. Russian fighter jet. Yeah. Okay. So I believe, and he wrote a, a, a North Pole one as well. Maybe a submarine one. Anyway, Santa steals a sub. Something. That... Yeah. Only not. Um, so it's uh, yeah. So it's I believe it's based on an Alexander McLean adventure novel. So yeah, what, like when I read the description of it, I was like, oh, here we go, another history lesson. But it's not doesn't play like a history lesson at all. It's an action movie, right? It's right, right. Straight it is. up, it is action movie. You know, a multinational group. There's there's a British officer, an American officer. There's a bunch of people from the island and uh, from the Greek resistance who help. Um, when did you? So when did you? You saw this through your dad? Yeah, I, I probably when I was ten or eleven. That's even, awesome. You know, the, the, this is the kind of. I mean, these, this is what was on TV on a Sunday afternoon. Uh-huh. You know, these kind of things were on TV on a Sunday afternoon, and so probably this would be from there. And so this does, this does get back a little bit to a sort of a, you know, to something I would have seen when I was a little. Yeah, kid or a, that's crazy. I would have been bored to tears when I was a kid, but. I and def- and maybe, maybe I was, but I, you know, <laughs> but it made an impression with you. My uh, three-year-old daughter sat on my lap and watched almost the entire thing and didn't say a word. And, like she was completely captivated. I think she hates Nazis. I think that's a that's ingrained in her. But um, what was cool in this movie? What just reminded me, like old movies in general had like opening narration a lot of times. Like first of all, the beginning of the movie just starts off with them thanking like Greece and for letting us film there and stuff. It's like that would never go by now. Like if you're not blo- if you haven't blown something up in the first 3 minutes, <laughs> but then there's like all the like they actually show newsreel footage and like give you the backstory so like you're up and running when the story starts like real smooth, but you know, you don't get that anymore. Let me ask you a question as I was watching this movie though. <clears throat> Do you think all Nazis were like uptight? <laughs> well, the there is that, right? But there, there is this. They're definitely sort of storybook villains. Yeah. Okay. Right. Because, like, I mean, yeah, you're coming at it the way I should have. I'm just like, like they're on a boat. The the good guys are on a boat, and then here comes the Nazi boat, you know, coming over. And it's like they're playing off like they're fishermen, like they're supposed to just be fishermen. And then these Nazis come up, and they're just like so. Uh, paranoid or uh, not paranoid, but they're just like so like where are your papers and this and that. And it's like so tense. It's like hey, they're just, maybe they're just fishermen. Ch- chill, guys. And also, every Nazi isn't Hitler's brother. Like, weren't there Nazis that were just had to be Nazis? Like they just didn't have any choice, so they probably were kind of lazy. Like every stormtrooper is not out to. <laughs> Right? But, we, but we didn't know that until the most well, recent Well, I'm saying, Star so Wars. maybe yeah. we need a movie where a Nazi rips off his patch and, like, goes and fights the war with a robot. That's a great movie. We're writing that tonight. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, they're just, yeah, you're right, though. They're very storybook, and it's like, they just are, they always, like, have a, like, they're just nervous, and they're always, like, you know, like, uh, everything's, everybody's out to get them. Like, they're just fishing, maybe. They are going to kill you in five minutes, but... <laughs> <laughs> and and there is a there's an escape there's like a locked room escape in the middle of this movie that is 
you know, there's like eight guards in the right, room, right, you know, okay. That, that, the, the, when Anthony Quinn's faking, yeah, yeah. Or telling the story, okay, yeah. So it kind of stretches reality a little bit that they 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 are able to distract and overpower a large number of armed guards. That, yeah, you know, you would imagine that that might not happen. This is definitely movie first history lesson, not even second or third. Yes. Yeah, it's definitely yeah. an action packed, um, and the and the some of the scenes are very epic. And they're not, you know, there's no CG, obviously, so there are definitely special effects, and you can tell, because mm-hmm. whatever, but it's just, like, you know they ran a boat up against a rock and destroyed it. They didn't fake that somehow, or whatever, right. and you have to appreciate that. Um, other note I made while watching it, they all drank from very tiny coffee mugs. Did you ever notice that watching? I have not seen that. I <laughs> well, I've now I ruined it, but next time you watch it, they're all drinking very teeny tiny coffee mugs. Maybe they all had really large hands. That's true. And that's why they were picked for this adventure. <laughs> See, you bring something to the table that... I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but again, the, a, a, love, a nice twist in the middle that you don't see coming, something that, that they do a really nice job of leading you one way and yeah. showing, you, showing you something else. Not as many twists or reverses as, as The Sting, but um, you know, definitely a, <clears throat> a, a significant twist. Um, yeah, and even like while the twist is happening, you're like, that's not, this isn't going to play out this way. It's going to, right? You, right and yeah, then, and then they're going to be wrong. Yeah, yeah. Um, another thing that's really interesting just talking about movies in general and like how things have changed okay this is 1961 this is a very i mean it's a serious movie there's some levity in it or whatever but we are so um uh as a whole as a movie going audience so cynical and uptight a little bit and so quick to label things cheesy or whatever the case is this is a very serious world war ii movie 1961 yet they still worked in a musical number somewhat in the middle of it and you got james darren who's one of the team in the whole movie and he's got the gun and he's fighting or whatever and in case you don't know james darren was a big uh teen idol in the 50s and 60s and this was like probably at the height of his popularity and um so he's in this movie and so it was probably like oh cool he's in it and then he still like sings a song and i guarantee that was a 45 that you could buy whatever that song was it was a pretty Probably. catchy song it's not a big musical number like nobody gets up and dances and he's a whatever but um it's just crazy how they always like jam a song into an old movie like that and that was just like a thing and it was actually early day like mass marketing like here we'll put a song in this movie and sell thirty thousand records but it's crazy i mean it's jimmy darren who was uh moon doggy in the gidget movies and he taught fred flintstone how to surf one time in hawaii when he was jimmy Darock. and here he, i was like that's so great this is just you know i guarantee there's no musical number in id4 coming out this summer or <laughs> whatever probably not but john's rolled his eyes like yes there's a musical number please don't <laughs> but I, again in that scene it's a large outdoor scene there's yeah. a, a lot of kind of people in the town square right there's a lot of like Communic- people communicating by glances, a lot of tension, a lot of like, how are we going to get out of this? And the the song is almost, it doesn't feel forced. Or right, like, no, no, yeah. Hey guys, here's Britney Spears. Right. Just, you know, it's like, um, it, it, is, it is a piece of, it's a decision they make in order to try to get out of a situation that they find themselves in. You know, it's... Yeah, it, it it fits organically, yeah. but it's it wouldn't yeah. work today. No, no, no. I would give my house and family away to anyone if you showed me a movie where Hitler introduced Britney Spears up on the balcony there. Like, I would go see that. Anyway. <laughs> All right. John's going to break into iTunes and erase this whole podcast <laughs> from. Um, and then, uh, so yeah, so it's just a, a great movie you guys should check it out i didn't get to start this until 11 30 at night and i was so ticked i was trying to get to it and like I'm like guys i have a two and a half hour movie i need to watch i need to get to this movie 11 30 i'm like i'm not gonna get to the whole thing totally captivated watched the whole thing it was so good it was really really good and and another another piece of, of evidence another example that older things hold up yeah know, that, definitely yeah that, i mean it is what it is right but if you watch it thinking that it is what it is, you can really enjoy it. They could probably take, I mean, this is, would be a sin in one way, but then again, not in another. If you take some of these older movies, like this Guns of Navarone, which is two, which was two and a half hours-ish, I think, 
you could probably snip it a little bit and make it a little tighter and not lose anything and make it like utterly accessible to the masses. Maybe like boost the color, you know, whatever. But it is, you're right, it is what it is. It's an old movie. And if you're not into old movies, then that's your loss, folks. But you're listening and you like it. One last thing on this movie. Directed by a guy named J. Lee Thompson, who also directed Cape Fear, which is another great Gregory Peck film. Have you seen that? Not the original. Oh, not the original. I, I saw the Robert De Niro remake. Which I think is supposed to be really, really good. It was yeah. at the time. I haven't seen that one. But Terrifying. The, the uh, Gregory Peck's in the remake, too. He's in the original. And then this guy directed a couple of the Conquest of the Planet of the Apes. And I'm not going to go here and name some movie about a turtle that won the Grand Prix or whatever as the uh, as what his last directing credit. But I just thought it was interesting that this guy who did all these classic movies later fell in with the Canon Film Group. Are you familiar with them? Who made absolute garbage throughout the 80s. And like his last seven movies he directed... Um, uh, uh, what, oh gosh, what's his name? Uh, Death Wish. Um, Charles Bronson. Br- Charles Bronson. He did like seven Charles Bronson films. His last film was Death Wish for the Crackdown. Thank you, sir. Um, (laughs) We are running up on the clock here, but we got two more to get to real quick. The Matrix, which we know everyone out there pretty much has seen, but tell us why you love The Matrix so much. So The Matrix is my lesson in getting off the couch and going to see a movie in the (laughs) theatre if you want to go see it in the theatre. I didn't see it. I saw all the advertising and I didn't go see it. And then when I finally caught it on DVD... I wished I'd been able to see it on the big screen. Again, it's it's a movie where you're looking at something... I mean, the whole, as you know, the whole premise of the movie is that you're looking at something and it's really something else. So, like some of these other movies, there's, there's something else going on. Um, the first 20 minutes, you, you, you get all these clues that something different is happening and you, your brain is trying to assemble the clues to figure out what actually happen what's actually happening i i really enjoy that and again i wish i could watch the first 20 minutes from cold again without knowing what the rest of the story is and then of course the special effects the fact that and the making of that's on the dvd where they show you they they couldn't do these things by computer the the where they fly around the 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 subject in the middle of the shot so they built this rig with 30 different cameras in it and took one frame oh, yeah. from each camera around the person you know that's a huge deal i think this movie would have been spectacular if they hadn't made the sequels <laughs> i think you're in the uh you know and if, if they hadn't you're in the common opinion in that right, department. right. All right the, yeah the, it, you come back and you have to pick up all the loose threads and make them make sense it's okay to leave those loose threads there nobody you know, after the first one, nobody was was worried about them. Our last film we're going to just touch on real quick because we should wrap it up is Layer Cake from 2004. I have never heard of this film. Um, I'm assuming you didn't see it in the theater. No. No. It's like a DVD straight. Th- is it a British film? Yeah. Okay, that's why. And it stars... Um, What's his name? <laughs> Daniel Craig. Daniel Craig, who, of course, here in the States, we all know from The Golden Compass. But from... <laughs> No, he's Bond. He's our current Bond. Is he out? He's like done Bond, right? Possibly. Possibly? Or possibly not. Nobody knows. Let's get it straight from you here on the show as a British guy. Who would be? Who should be the next Bond? Oh, I have no idea. No idea? No. No? I really don't. Do you care? Not really. <laughs> it's one of those things where they always surprise you and they do a really good job. Yeah. You know, that they, they make it work. It's like when Doctor Who changes. You're like, that can't be that. And then two weeks later, you like it again. So. Right, right. Okay. So, um, yeah, Layer Cake, is the, but it's the first film from the guy that did uh, Kingsman and Kick-Ass. Did you see Kingsman? I heard I that's awesome. I haven't seen Kingsman. I've seen Kick-Ass. Yeah. And uh, so tell us real quick what this is about and why you love it. So <laughs> I'll just uh, let you do all the work. And... <laughs> <laughs> um, so the Daniel Craig character, it, it's based on a novel. Uh, the Daniel Craig character has no name. He never says his name. Nobody ever says his name. Um, he it's is, Cake. It's Cake. Yeah, his name's Cake. His first name's Leia. Um, he's a cocaine dealer, and he has very compartmentalized life. He's decided he's going to save a million dollars and then retire. Um, and really, and he he comes very close to that goal right at the beginning of the movie. Everything's neat and tidy. He's just going to take his money and run. Uh, and then many things go wrong, all in a row. 
This is the shortest movie on your list, by the way, at an hour and 45. So, But it's very uh, it's accessible. You can find it on DVD. Also worth mentioning, uh, The Sting is on Netflix this month. So that's another way to check that out easily. And, folks, you should. Check out all of John's movies. Gettysburg, The Sting, The Matrix, The Guns of Navarone, and, which is not a Western, and Layer Cake. Well, we are just about out of time here, John. Thank you very much for stopping by, for coming up here and chatting movies with you i hope you had a good time sure thanks for the invite it was uh fun and informative and we all learned a little something about several wars that we've had over (laughs) and the spice girls um have you never seen spice world still i have still never seen spice world (laughs) it was my dream and probably still is to sit down and watch it with you and just have you break it down like I could 13 hours just break it down. Like, let's just do scene by scene. What's this? What's that? What does that mean? And there's cameos in it that I don't know. Like, I know it's a cameo, but I don't know who it is because it's from some TV show. Whatever. Ed, could you please shut up about Spice World? Well, if if you want to do, like, a 20th episode (laughs) special. Where we just sit and watch. We'll do the Spice World (laughs) breakdown anniversary special. That'll be so good. And no one will. uh, You know what? People would listen because people love Spice World. All right, folks. This is Ed South at Ed South on Twitter.com. Please follow us on Twitter. The show is at WYF Movie Podcast. I won't even bother with the email again. If you have a minute, wait, rate, review, subscribe, all that good stuff. It helps us out here in the long run. And uh, I just wanted to give a, a, a quick shout out to uh, two people. My friend Kevin, who's been on the show twice, who like tirelessly and un... I haven't asked him to do this. He just constantly is promoting the show all over any little nook and cranny he can find on the internet. And I just wanted to tell him here I appreciate that. And he's made all our numbers uh, when all the episodes grow. And uh, I got to thank producer Brian, who has yet to be on the show or working out the kinks on getting him in here via Skype for that. But every single creative decision I've had to make since the moment I decided to do this until just before we record it, I bounce it off of him. He gets endless amounts of text. Should I do this? Should I do that? Should I do this? And he's been awesome. And I just want to thank him also for that. Um, and guys, don't forget for unique and exclusive t-shirts inspired by nostalgia, pop culture, and iconic movie themes. It's dexshirts.com. Use our exclusive promo code WYF movie for 20% off your order at Dex Shirts. That's D-E-X shirts.com. All right, guys, thanks for listening to the show. Uh, thanks for joining us, and we will see you again real soon. Don't forget, it's khaki wishes and cookie dreams. Bye-bye.